So my name is Ryan Moore. Uh, I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and I'm the medical director of digital health innovation and also the founder of our digital experience technologies program. So we use 3D technology for a variety of ways. Again, through our digital experience technologies program, we have our 3D modeling, 3D printing, A AR, VR, and we use them for clinical use. So we use them to plan cases um, for surgeons so that uh, they can you know, see what they're gonna do before they go into the operating room. Um, we use it for uh, education. So we use the, the modeling that we do, and then we can actually um, use it for provider uh, education, and then also for them to be able to learn a little bit more about either anatomy or build it into an avatar so we get some more realistic uh, avatar usage from that perspective. And then we also use it for patient family education. And so we um, have setups where we either print models for patients and families and we give them to uh, the, the kids, um, or we actually have setups where we do virtual reality and then the kids will come into the VR space, um, often with their surgeon, and then be able to look at the operation together. Um, parents are you know, obviously involved in that process. And so that's become one of the newer ventures that we've uh, achieved recently. One of the other kind of passions of mine is um, I went to school originally for art um, and then found in a roundabout way, uh, uh, turned into a cardiologist. And so now I've actually come back to that and um, I do a lot of uh, different uh, work for kids. Um, one specifically was a character I created um, called Hank, which stands for Heart, Activity, Nutrition, and Kindness. And so this character is one of the ones that we use to teach kids about the heart. Um, we did a children's book with it. We've done animation with it. And now that I've learned 3D printing skills for Materialize, we 3D print Hank in various different forms. And so it's become like, you know, a fun thing, especially around Heart Month um, in February to be able to work with kids, work with schools and, you know, do a lot of different fun things with it. So. Yeah, so historically it's been mostly weight based is how they're matched. And so a child who's listed for a heart transplant, um, they would list the weight um, and they would be matched with a donor based on weight. But one of the challenges of that is that they might be missing out on potential other donors that are available because we're not using the actual size of the organ that they need to be matched. Um, and because one of the main issues of um, a patient who's listed up for a transplant is being on the wait list a long time, and there's an increase of mortality with that, about 30% increased risk of mortality being on a wait list, um, we want to be able to match them to as quickly as possible to a donor. Um, and also because organs aren't readily available um, and there's a concern that they might be getting, you know, too big of an organ or something of that nature, um, the size mismatch is another issue. So we wanted to prove that that wasn't as much of a problem as what was perceived to be by just, you know, being able to match patients to the actual organ and the donor size. Yeah, so what we actually do is we take a CT scan or an MRI and we um, through our kind of experience in working with Materialize and using the Mimic software, we're actually able to model the heart and do the total cardiac volume for each patient who's listed for transplant. We can also take a separate set of potentially normal patient information, um, normal CT scans, and get uh, almost a population-based donor size. And that's something where we've been able to do a lot of research and publish a lot on this um, topic um, so that we can actually match patients based on the actual organ size by using 3D modeling and segmentation of the total cardiac volume. I think the biggest thing um, right now that we're seeing in imaging um, using artificial intelligence is the ability to do deep learning model development based off of image segmentation and anatomic segmentation. And that's been what I think one of the real good use cases in healthcare and using AI right now is the ability to take images and do imaging segmentation from it. So we worked with Materialize and the group that's developing all the AI modeling um, potential through Mimics um, by creating a total cardiac volume algorithm. And so what we did was we took in a bunch of our scan data, we created the AI model for it, and now we can apply that model um, so that now something that might take, you know, 
10, 20, 30 minutes, depending on the user's experience, um, can now take 10 seconds. And the benefit to that is when a patient gets um, an offer for, a don for an organ, um, it's often a very quick decision that the heart failure doctor has to make, that the surgical team has to make in order to you know, accept the organ and then be able to um, have the organ transplanted to wherever the patient is at. And so we want to make sure that we're not a bottleneck in that process by even a few minutes. So I think you know, 3D printing to me is a, just an output of the you know, most important part of what we do create, which is the digital twin of a patient's anatomy. So with that ability to create an anatomic digital twin, you can then 3D print it, you can put it into augmented reality, you can put it into virtual reality, um, you can gamify it, you can animate it. There's so many different options that you can do once you have that very important you know, digital copy of a, of a patient's heart. So the way that we're doing it now is we're actually working with Unity, um, which is one of the game engine companies, to develop um, a VR platform that's very user-friendly for surgeons. And so, um, and historically, most of the VR platforms that people are you know, using or talking about is purely based on visualization. And so it's taking whatever's on the monitor, putting it in immersive VR space, and it's really just, you know, again, taking more visualization approach. What we're really trying to do is get into the ability to manipulate the model, to plan out a surgery directly on the model, and have the surgeon who's um, not used to working in a 3D space on like a laptop or a desktop, be able to work in a 3D space to plan out what the exact operation is going to be in order to then take that um, to the OR and take that knowledge transfer to the OR so that they can plan more complex cases. And we've done this now for I would say probably over, you know, well, hundreds of cases we've done on the, uh, the desktop, and I would say our surgeon's done, you know, you know, quite a few cases now in VR for planning. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, it's kind of similar historical things that what 3D modeling, 3D printing have done. Um, for our patients with, you know, complex congenital heart disease, it'd be biventricular repairs is probably one of the top things. Um, but we also do a lot of work with, um, you know, any sort of adult devices like um, ventricular assist devices, total official heart, we usually plan those in virtual reality. Again, anything that you can give the surgeon, you know, as the primary user, the ability to make their plan um, and to, you know, manipulate the anatomy in whatever way that they need, I think that's what we're um, targeting for these. And so those are the most common ones that we use. but. Um, We've actually started to get a lot of requests from patients and families that they want to go in there and they want to see what the heart looks like. And so we've had our surgeons now paired up with our patients and our families to go in there. And, you know, for any procedure that I would say is, you know, a little bit on the complex side that we have a model for, we have a CT or MRI for, we'll plan it with the patients if they request it. Yeah, I think the main advantages of, you know, these new extended realities like virtual reality, augmented reality is really expanding out to different users who might not be as familiar as, you know, working in a 3D space as, you know, engineers are, 3D imaging um, doctors, uh, artists who, you know, get very familiar working on a desktop. Um, but now it's expanding everybody to be able to work in an immersive 3D environment, which is what we live in. Um, and so it's an opportunity now to expand it so that really everybody has those opportunities to, to interact and engage with those 3D models. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge right now is adoption. I think it's, you know, like we've seen with other technologies, it takes time for people to get, you know, comfortable and familiar with them. Um, I think there's um, always a big hype cycle around stuff, but you really have to validate you know, the benefit of it and find the value in it. And I think that's another thing where, you know, we've worked with Materialize for a long time. And really, I think that validation component and really showing what that value added is, either it's 3D printing or VR, um, but ultimately, again, getting to that, that nice uh, example of a digital twin representation of a patient's anatomy, how beneficial that can be for patients for surgical planning um, is really what we need to emphasize. And then whatever the output is, is really gonna be based on the user. So taking a user's first mentality, do they want a 3D printed model? Do they wanna do it in VR? Do they wanna do it in AR? You just have all the options available.
Yeah, I think the future is, um, like a lot of people are talking about the metaverse. Um, I think, you know, the metaverse needs a lot of work and needs a lot of, um, I think, motivated people to, to really get it to that serious use case of how we're applying that. I think we've done a lot of work on our side and we're partnering with Unity um, in terms of building a, a metaverse um, setup. And I think it's going to involve a lot of different technology partners, Materialize, Microsoft, um, others that are, you know, you know, claiming to, to want to work in this space to work together with large academic centers so that we can start to um, build a collaborative network that would only not only just, you know, have a metaverse for the sake of having a metaverse, but have a metaverse with a purpose. And so the purpose for us would be to be able to have it so that we can plan operations um, with, you know, any sort of complex operation that, you know, our surgeon in Cincinnati wants to plan with a surgeon in Japan, they can get into that same space and they can, you know, really talk about what is the challenges of the procedure and even start to plan out what the operation would be. And then from there, I think some other benefits of where we're at is having translation capabilities so people can speak in their native languages and it can be translated in that space. Um, and, you know, there's so many potential things to do with it. Um, we just have to really work and refine it and define what we're gonna do.